I'm Casey James, and this is the story of the Bridge House. I headed back into the house, rather than venturing outside, to investigate the rose-covered and overgrown veranda in the dark, which was my only other option, aside from sleeping on the dining room table, which really didn't appeal after that dream, if it was a dream. I really, really hope it was a dream. I do not need to be dealing with fucking Count Dracula on top of everything else. Which left retracing my steps, back through the music room and the living room, to the stairs I'd seen in the foyer by the front door. I did that, and then paused in the foyer, pondering. A crash of thunder emphasised that I really couldn't just go outside. In the downpour, I'd have trouble even staying on the road. And that was if I wasn't at risk of being hit by bloody lightning. So, the stairs. Up seemed safer than heading down into the basement, so I started upward to the second floor. The stairwell had the feel of something from a Victorian novel or maybe from some fantastical submarine, like the Nautilus. It was narrow and enclosed, softly lit by wall-mounted lamps made to look like old-fashioned gas lanterns. Blue and gold wallpaper, patterned like fish scales, shimmered in the dim light, and the stairs themselves were a pale, blonde wood, polished until they gleamed. An old map was framed on the wall, brown ink slowly fading to illegibility. But there were no other pictures, no photographs or prints. After the neglect and wreckage of the ground floor, this space was oddly serene, as if time and abandonment hadn't touched it at all. It felt like walking up through some sort of still ocean pool, climbing up towards the second floor. I paused to look at the map, my eye drawn by the contour lines that spiralled across it. The paper was heavy and old, maybe parchment or vellum, or something made to look like it, the yellow-beige colour of tea stains or toasted cream. The outlines of land masses and continents were almost familiar, some coastlines narrower than I remembered them, as if the seas were higher than they should be none of the place names were familiar. The ones I could read, at any rate. Most of them were illegible. Pale brown ink faded into the pale beige paper, made more difficult still by the spidery curls and lines of handwritten labels. The whole thing looked hand-drawn, though I'm no art critic, and it could have been a clever print. I shrugged and moved on, mouthing the unfamiliar names to myself as I climbed. Ulthar and Selephaeus, Inganok and Leng and Koth. I felt as if I should know them, somehow, although I didn't. On a whim, I took a photograph of the map with my phone before I continued up the stairs. At the landing, the stairs kept going up, and, lulled by the calm serenity of that narrow liminal space... I followed them upwards. I remembered seeing a cupola tower from outside the house, and it occurred to me to wonder if it was still structurally stable and weathertight. I wasn't thinking of retreating to it to sleep, though. My desire to find a safe and haunt-free place for the night was forgotten in the moment, eclipsed by my desire to explore the house. In the calm of the blue stairwell, My fright downstairs seemed to me to be rather an overreaction. I had no reason for the horror I felt towards the fawn statue, or the piano, or even for how much my imaginings of Kezia disturbed me. The heart in the study was something else, but even there, nothing had actually happened. There was no rational explanation for that slowly pulsing heart nor would any such explanation have made me feel better about it. All the same, 
If visions and memories and a creepy, horrible piece of meat feigning some semblance of life were the worst of what I encountered here, that wouldn't be so bad. A bad dream after dozing off in the kitchen wasn't even unexpected, and I told myself that the pale man was nothing more than an episode of sleep paralysis. Nothing supernatural about that, disturbing as it was. I knew on some level that it wasn't true, but it could have been. And Kezia, the living room, even the visions in the music room and the fawn, I shuddered at the thought. It could all be explained away as an overactive imagination at work in a creepy abandoned house. I had no explanation for the heart, but I conveniently ignored that. Honestly, I had no good explanation for why I was here at all. As I considered it, my feet carried me further up the stairs and towards the tower. The blue and gold wallpaper was unchanged on the second flight, but it no longer carried the calm, dreamlike feeling of a tide pool. Ascending, the walls were crowded with carefully hung seashells and artworks, placed one by the other in a driftwood stack of mismatched frames and styles. Pen and ink sketches shared space with hyper-coloured oil paintings and metal wire inlays of strange, half-familiar patterns. Watercolours swirled with the smoky colours of storms and twilight skies, contrasted beside angular black-and-white block prints, all of strange contorted bodies and creatures. I kept glimpsing things that were half-familiar to me from my dreams, even dreams I'd thought were unrelated. Here, cats lazed on the docks of some strange city, golden spires visible behind them. And there, fishermen impaled whales and giant squid with harpoons, while some great sea serpent thrashed in the water. A mermaid hung upside down from the ceiling of a small room, perhaps the hold of a ship, impaled by a hook pierced through her tail, blood trailing down her pale limbs. A spire of black stone rose from a wild ocean under a looming crescent moon. A stormy beach stood under a pale sky, littered with driftwood that, on closer inspection, turned out to be mangled and dismembered human body parts. I'd seen each of those images before, and more besides. I'd dreamed the shanties sung by the sailors as they hauled the ropes and sails in, pursuing the leviathan which spilled blood into that ocean. I knew the smell of salt-rotted blood on that beach, the creaking of unseen timbers and the cries of the gulls along the dunes. Only a glimpse of the painting, and I remembered the sound of the mermaid's despairing, eerie song as her flesh was pierced by that iron hook. The look in her glass-green eyes as they faded and dulled. The laughter of the sailors who had caught her. The feeling of their knives sliding between her ribs and under her scales. They planned to eat her, to steal her immortality by ingesting her flesh and blood and bones. Their greed was almost sexual, a lust to own and possess and consume. For a second, I could feel it. Cold metal sliding between bones I didn't have, sharp as winter. The walls seethed and rippled like the grey-green sky before a storm on the ocean. I felt light-headed, dizzy, as if the ground were moving under my feet with the slow, rhythmic swell and sway of the sea. I reached out to the wall to catch my balance, and I almost expected to feel salt water dripping under my fingers. I didn't, though the wall was cold as ice. Light-headed, Fingers splayed on the wallpaper. My gaze dropped and caught on a deck of cards lying against the wall on the stairs. The cards were spread in a fanned-out pile, scattered, without any apparent pattern, all of them face down except one. The Joker lay face up, a black-and-white clown's face staring up at me with a fishhook pierced through his cheek 
dragging one half of his mouth up in a rictus smile while the other half turned down. The card bags were blue and gold, like the wallpaper, and their edges were unevenly scorched and singed. I might have imagined the faintest whiff of smoke, salt and ash like a lonely campfire, while the rain outside beat on the roof like the sound of waves breaking. The dim light glittered on the card bags, like a dream of light on a blade, on dark, deep water. The drowned smile of the Joker stared up at me, daring me to do something, anything. Take the cards or ignore them. Turn another face up, read my future in their patterns. I didn't touch them. Maybe it was an overreaction, maybe it wasn't. But there was something about this place, something uncanny and unfathomable. I had chills crawling up and down my spine already, between Kezia, the creature in the kitchen, which I didn't truly believe to be a sleep paralysis dream, and the fawn in the music room. There was no way I was touching anything as clearly haunted and seethingly malevolent as that deck of cards. Especially not when it made me think of the hook through that mermaid's tail and the half-remembered voices of sailors laughing and joking about eating her, about whether they should have fucked her first. Nausea rolled through me as I hurried up the stairs, skipping the step where the cards lay. It was a relief to reach the top. The tower room was set up as a library or study, and it was, in fact, both weathertight and structurally stable. It was also the warmest space I'd been in yet in the bridge house, with a sense of almost surreal solidity to it. I hadn't realised just how much the lower floor and the staircase had disturbed me until I stepped into the tower room and felt a weight lift from my shoulders. If the stairwell was water, the tower library was the surface of the sea. Windows on three sides brought in the bright, crystalline starlight of the night outside as the storm clouds parted and scudded across the sky. Bookshelves in dark wood lined the rest of the walls, and a comfortably worn wingback chair rested in the centre of the room, upholstered in some dark colour. A reading lamp and a small coffee table stood beside it. An elegant Persian rug softened the otherwise bare wooden floor, and I could imagine sitting in here, reading, with a cup of tea or a glass of wine. I flicked on the light switch at the door. The light was a dim, golden incandescent, just like the lights downstairs. Here, however, it felt comforting, filtering everything through tourmaline and softening it just a little, rather than hiding it in half-lit shadows. Relief carvings of curious, runic figures danced across the edges of the bookcases and continued on the wood panelling of the walls themselves, tribal and angular, there was no wallpaper here, just red-brown panels of some likely near-extinct timber, and more of those sigils burned into the corners. Seven fist-sized crystals sat on the coffee table, semi-precious stones, arrayed in a circle like a miniature Stonehenge or some sort of divinatory ritual. They glittered with refracted light, all different, I recognised some of them. Amethyst, rose quartz, a red gold stone that was probably garnet. But the others could have been anything. One was a translucent blue, one a cloudy, pale green with stripes of darker green, and two were clear. The stone at the northmost point was one of the clear ones, and it was an exact match for the one I'd seen in whatever vision it was that came over me when I first grasped the doorknob to come into the bridge house. A hexagonal shape, clear like cloudy ice, with light refracted into and back out of it in circling patterns like a star. I stepped forward and reached for it, 
but something held me back from actually touching the stone, some whisper of instinct or memory. I hesitated, and in that moment of indecision, I heard someone chuckle. <laughs> Glancing around wildly, I saw no one, but a voice, dark and masculine, said, Wise choice. What? I asked. Why? Who are you? An ether stone full of darkness would certainly be interesting, but I doubt you'd appreciate it, the voice said. A what now? I asked. A crystal of ether can hold darkness or light, said the voice, but not both at the same time. This one is full of shadows. You are not yet. I wrapped my arms around myself, digging my fingers into my biceps and trying to hold back the urge to do something unforgivably stupid, like make untoward sarcastic comments, or just fling myself out of one of the windows. I did not sign up for actual ghosts or disembodied phantom voices any more than I did for dream vampires. Also, I was either hallucinating badly, or else this was strong evidence that my dream in the kitchen had been more than just a dream. Oh, I managed, probably sounding almost as confused and disturbed as I felt. The disembodied voice chuckled again. <laughs> then it said, If you take the stone without first lighting it, you will take the darkness into you. You will become the portal, as the house is now, open to anything and everything that wants to come through. Oh, I said again. Yes, that sounds like a bad idea. A phantom hand brushed my cheek, just the gentlest of touches, like someone touching their fingertips to my skin. I startled away as if I'd been scalded, looking around again, but there was no one there. At least it wasn't the scalding, hot-cold touch of the pale man downstairs, although that indicated there might be multiple haunts in the house. Yes, said the voice. It generally doesn't go well done like that. Possession should be a far more personal experience. I shivered. I'm starting to regret coming inside, I muttered. Too late for that, said the voice. Much too late for that.